in any way possible. He is one of the first people I go to with new ideas or initiatives to help small business. He knows I am a rabid advocate for this population, and he puts up with and even respects my perseverance. Tim Bishop, the champion of small business. He has heard me say that this is a congressman who lives and breathes Long Island and goes to Washington to represent us. Too many times our elected officials become Washington politicians who visit their home regions. We have worked together on advisory boards and task force opportunities. And Tim not only su supports the small business community of Long Island, he leads the charge to help them in any way possible. I know this from personal experience. How many of you, how many people can you ask to speak on such light topics as fiscal cliff, sequestration, and national debt at 9 o'clock in the morning and have them show up? I know some who would rather jump off the fiscal cliff. And let's just add to it that this is Holy Week and Passover. Yeah. <laughs> so Tim just said, sure, why not? It's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Tim Bishop. Well, good morning to all of you. And thank you, Gloria, for that <clears throat> very, very kind introduction. And more importantly, thank you for the leadership that you provide to the, the small business community of Long Island. And um, there was one thing left out of my biography, and it is Holy Week, so I should... I should let you know that I went to Holy Cross College, so, uh, uh, so. <clears throat> Oh, I missed it. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. The Jesuits won't mind. But, uh, um, I am, I, we, have, we have a bunch of issues that all come together. I mean, there is fiscal cliff, there is sequestration, there's the continuing resolution, there's the debt limit uh, uh, that will be bumping up against uh, sometime this summer, and then there are there is the budget debate for fiscal 2014. They all come together. You can deal with each of them as a distinct entity, uh, and that is, in fact, what we're doing legislatively, but in terms of its impact on uh, the American people and its impact on the small business community, they really are a set of interrelated policy decisions. Uh, seek, uh, pardon me, the fiscal cliff, um, uh, I mean, you all know the contours of the deal. Uh, families uh, that make more than $450,000 a year had their tax rates go up to the Clinton era rates, top rate 39.6 from 35. I should point out, first tax increase uh, since 1993. A lot of people talk about the federal burden of taxation. I don't mean to diminish it, but you should know that no federal tax rate moved at all from 1993 to 2013. So there have been tax increases, but they have been largely uh, state and local taxes as opposed to as opposed to federal. Uh, that meant that basically 99% of America kept their rate uh, at, uh, at the, uh, the so-called Bush era rates, 35% is the top rate, and it means that roughly 98% of small businesses kept their rate at the Bush era maximum of 35%. That, that deal uh, extended the R&D tax credit for a year, it extended the work opportunity tax credit for a year, it extended bonus depreciation for a year, and then there was sort of a, a collection of other uh, so, sort of smaller, more targeted uh, tax uh, tax provisions that were extended as well. On balance, as far as taxes, I think most people thought that it was a fair and reasonable way to go forward, and in fact, it passed both, both chambers with bipartisan support. It included a two-month extension of uh, a two-month extension of the deadline by which sequestration would come into play. Originally, as a, under the terms of the Budget Control Act passed in July of two or August of 2011, sequestration was supposed to hit January 1st, 2013. It was extended to uh, March 1st, 2013. The expectation, both in July of 2011 and in fact in January of 2013 was that sequestration was something that we would never ever get to. It was in fact designed so that we would never get to it. It was designed to be so onerous that reasonable people would look at it and say we can't possibly enact the implications of this into law. Guess what? 
uh, we enacted them into law, and one might argue that we did so because there were not a sufficient number of reasonable people who could look at it and say, uh, we can't do this. Um, my own view uh, is that sequestration represents very, very poor uh, public policy, and we will be feeling the implications of it for a while. Now, one of the things uh, I, I think uh, I will say candidly that I think the Obama administration made a mistake when they were uh, sort of going around the country talking about all the horrible things that were going to happen with sequestration. Um, because March 1st came and the world continued to spin and the sky didn't fall. And so people were saying, see, it's no big deal. We can cut $85 billion and nobody notices. Guess what? Uh, we are going to start to notice because um, of the various notice requirements that federal employees are, uh, are uh, obligated to receive and the various uh, notices that uh, federal contractors are obligated to receive. Everybody's obligated to get at least 30 days written notice if they're going to face either furlough or layoff. Those notices went out the first week in March. And so on or about the first or the second week of April, we're going to begin to see real live people lose their jobs. We're going to begin to see, uh, honest to God, federal contracts canceled. Uh, and we're going to see federal subcontractors laid off. That's just the reality. We're going to cut $85 billion over a seven-month period out of what we normally do. The Congressional Budget Office has estimated that that will cost approximately 750,000 jobs in calendar 2013. So 750,000 people who are working right now, according to the Congressional Budget Office, will not be working June of 13, July of 13, August of 13. Um, and it's estimated that approximately 50 to 55 percent of those jobs will be small business jobs. Federal government does over $100 billion a year worth of subcontracting to small businesses. Those contracts are going to, uh, some of them will simply go away. Some of them will be, will be reduced in value. Um, Others won't be continued, and so it's it's we're going to see a lot of we are going to see uh, lines at at, uh, at airports. We are going to see uh, <clears throat> it, it taking longer to land and take off because there are fewer air traffic controllers. We are going to see right here at this university uh, approximately seven and a half million dollars worth of NIH and NSF grants cut. I mean, the, the the cut will be approximately seven. Uh, will be approximately seven and a half million dollars. The university uses a uh, uh, a multiplier of they, they assume uh, roughly um, uh, that this will cost them roughly um, 60 jobs, 60 well-paying, well-qualified jobs. So that's an implication. And then when you add to that whatever it is we are, I'm sorry, let me back up a little bit. Sequestration has now been enshrined uh, in law for the balance of this fiscal year. Um, we passed a continuing resolution, um, I guess last Thursday, um, that reflected the judgment of the House and the Senate. I will tell you, I voted against, uh, I voted against it, not because I want to shut down the government, I don't think that helps anyone, but because I think the implications of, of now codifying for at least a year um, these cuts, which are less indiscriminate now because of the continuing resolution than they had been when they were first uh, contemplated. First contemplation was that we would simply cut um, roughly 8% across the board, indiscriminate. So every single account in the federal government would be cut by 8%. Um, people began to realize not such a good idea. For example, uh, we have laws that suggest that uh, uh, there needs to be an FDA inspector on the floor at all times when a meatpacking plant is operating. Pretty reasonable law, it seems to me. Keeps us safe, keeps our food supply safe. Well, if you cut food inspectors by 8%, which is what the law required, you wouldn't be able to maintain that requirement. And therefore, packing plants would, uh, pardon me, uh, slaughtering houses would 
shut down. The implication obviously being that, that the price of food would go up because the price of meat would be, I mean, meat would be less readily available. So that, that, that's been fixed. Some of the air traffic control problems have been fixed. Uh, the, now the Office of Science, something that we all ought to be very concerned about given the implications for Brookhaven Lab to our, to our local economy, that now has the flexibility to apportion the cuts as they see fit as opposed to having every single account reduced by 8.5%. So we have improved the policy with, or the, the statute with respect to sequestration, but in my opinion, it, it remains a very poor public policy that is going to be very detrimental to lots of interests. I mean, on Long Island alone, again, we all complain about taxes. The principal driver of taxes on Long Island are our school budgets. Mm -hmm. On Long Island alone, tens of millions of dollars of, of Title I money that flows directly to K-12 education and IDEA money, special ed money, that flows directly to K-12 education will be cut effective September 1st, 2013. Now, schools only have two choices. Three, I have three choices. One is to simply stop doing what those, fund, those monies provided them with the ability to do. I wouldn't say, say that's a real good choice. The second is to stop doing other things that they do so that they can continue to fund what the federal government used to fund but now will not fund, like maybe they get rid of AP classes, maybe they get rid of music, maybe they get rid of trips. Who knows what schools decide to do. And then the third choice is to, is to load it onto the real property tax levy and hope that you can pierce the 2% property tax cap. Those are the only choices that schools have to accommodate a reduction um, in, uh, in federal money, and yet that reduction is real and it will have an impact. And again, right here at this university, the largest employer in the first congressional district, 18,000 students, 18,000 employees, huge cuts uh, in, uh, as I said, in NIH and NSF, and big cuts to two of the four student financial aid programs that <coughs> support an enormous number of young men and women who go to this school. That will have an implication. So, at any rate, I am hopeful. Oh, my, I've, I've taken too long. Right? No, you're not. No, 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 no. You don't understand. You're it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I am hopeful that at the next decision point, which will be the extension of the debt limit, we will be able to, we have more time, and we will be able to put in place some means of going forward that does recognize that we do need to reduce our spending, but we need to do it in a targeted way. And it does recognize that if we are going to reduce our deficit, that needs to be done in a balanced way. And as I say, we will sometime between the 17th of May and estimated the 15th of August, we will bump up against the debt limit. And that's because there was legislation passed in January that simply suspended enforcement of the debt limit for three months. Now, just think about that for a second. We are telling ourselves that the debt limit is an absolutely crucial thing. We are telling ourselves that, that the debt limit and what it level is and its enforcement is absolutely essential to our future well-being in terms of fiscal stability. And yet, the Congress passed legislation that simply said, you know what, we're going to ignore it for three months. Think about that. Think, think about that. So, but we are going to enforce it sometime, whenever we hit it again, sometime between the middle of May and the middle of, of, um, of August. And, um, and I will say to you that there's no, no option but to extend the debt limit. And anyone who suggests to you that we need some tough love here, that we need to take our bitter medicine, and we need to live within our means, and we need to take whatever cliche you want, that we need to rip up the national credit card, and we need to start operating the way families operate, anyone who suggests that to you 
either doesn't understand the finances of this country or is callously indifferent to what this country does on a day-to-day -day basis with its money. I'll just stop, close with this. If you look at where the federal government spends its money, we spend $3.7 trillion a year, a lot of money. 48 cents of every dollar we spend is on people over the age of 65. Think about that. 48 cents of every dollar. Social Security, Medicare, that portion of Medicaid, approximately 60%, that finances people in nursing homes, senior nutrition programs, and so on. 48 cents of every dollar. Know this. The average Social Security recipient takes in $13,000 a year. And the average Social Security recipient right now takes out of the system approximately what he or she has been put has put into the system over the course of their working lives. So if the average is 13000 a year, if one out of every three seniors in this country, which is a fact, gets 100% of their income from Social Security, just ask yourself how far we can go with Social Security. Not real far, in my opinion. Medicare. The median income for Medicare recipients in this country is $22,700. So half of the people in this country that get Medicare, half of the 46 million people that get Medicare make less than $22,700 a year. So ask yourself, what are we going to do with Medicare? Again, we don't have a lot of choice. So in Medicaid, like I said, 60% of what we spend on Medicaid is long-term care for seniors and the, and the severely disabled. 18 cents of every dollar we spend is on defense. And 9 cents of every dollar we spend is on interest on the national debt. So in just three areas, seniors, national security, and interest, we've covered 75 cents of every dollar we spend. So if anyone says to you, rip up the credit card, ask them to come with you to a senior center and explain it to the seniors. Why? They'll say, look, we'll catch you next month. You can't make payroll this month. We can't, we, can't, we can't make our payment to you this month, but we'll catch you next month. Or tell physicians that are providing services to Medicare that, you know what, you're, you're making out like bandits, we're going to cut you. Tough conversation to have, particularly when it's not true. So, it's, so what we need, in my opinion, is a balanced approach that weighs our obligations as a country, the implications if we fall short of those obligations, and recognizes that, that if we try to do all of it by cutting, which, by the way, is the current position of our friends on the other side of the aisle. What they've said is, Mr. Obama, you've gotten your tax increase, the fiscal cliff tax increase that went to 1% of America. And so everything else is now going to come out of, out of spending. And just know that if we do that, we are going to, we are going to um, impose a significant amount of pain on probably that subset of our population that is least able to accommodate that pain. So we've got to find, we've got to set aside the rhetoric, we've got to set aside the finger pointing, we've got to set aside the recriminations and the political posture and figure out what's fair. And I'm hopeful that in this process between now and let's say the middle of August, we'll be able to get that done. So I'll, with that, I'll stop. I know you'll have questions for, for me and the panel. I hope I didn't take too long. But thanks. Thank you.